Hi guys, welcome to character drawing tutorial. This one is about stylization, design, and personality. So this is the third and last video of a three-part video series I'm doing on character drawing fundamentals. To catch you up if you're not aware, this is an edited down version of a class I taught three or four years ago on class 101 called Drawing Characters in Motion, Anatomy, Appeal, Posing, and More. These three videos are my personal favorite videos that I have edited down for you guys to post for free. The full class can be bought on Payhip. I'll link it in the description for $30 if you're interested. Essentially, this class goes from absolute fundamentals of drawing into basics for drawing the human body and posing and dynamic character art and ends with character stylization and design. So these are the three sections that I've chosen to edit for you guys. This last video is about like making characters, designing characters. It's a lot less technical in my opinion than the previous two. So I hope this is helpful for those of you who are interested in like creating your own characters or creating stories and kind of merging the practices of design and story together. That is the goal here. So yeah, let's get to it. Hey guys, so today we're going to talk about proportion when it comes to character stylization. Here I've created a lineup of characters to show you how much variety there is when it comes to character design and character stylization. I've kind of ordered it from childlike to adult-like, but this is kind of a hand wavy scale. The way I really ordered it was by head size. On the left, these characters' heads are a lot bigger and it just gets smaller and smaller as we go down the scale. It's probably a concept you're very familiar with. I think basically every character designer you might learn from is going to be like a childlike proportion is where their head is like the same size or maybe even bigger than the rest of their body. And as you get more adult-like, these proportions get a lot more exaggerated in the opposite direction. Like I would just like to look at Seraphine here. Seraphine from League of Legends, her proportions are kind of wild. Two thirds of her entire body is her legs. And something that I find extremely funny is that it's the same exact proportions apply to Suzaku from Code Geass here. Like if we wanted to make Suzaku more normal, his legs would probably have to be like around this length, right? This is how we usually understand like normal body proportions, but by extending his legs so far, it makes Code Geass really have an interesting style. And same thing with this old man from Up, he is down by the childlike spectrum. But if we took his head and made it like a normal human sized head, it would probably be around here. And this is definitely not as interesting as how it used to be. And the head is not the only part that you can exaggerate. You can do it with any part of the body. For example, Gamagori here from Kill la Kill. His head is definitely really, really small in comparison to the rest of his body. But just look at his hands. His hands are like twice or maybe three times the size of his head here. And so if you wanted to make Gamagori more normal, what you would do is make his head a lot bigger. And so he becomes like a more normal human sized man and you would make his hands smaller too. But this is like not such an interesting character design. We just made him boring. The reason he is interesting is because he is so exaggerated in these ways. And if you watched Kill a Kill, you know that the point of Gamagori's character is that he is huge. So even though he's not actually like a titan size, they exaggerate him to be that size in order to really push the point that he is way larger than the other characters. And this is kind of what we want to learn to do. Um, speaking from personal experience, it's really hard for me to break away from drawing in this sort of spectrum here, like in the complete normal human proportion spectrum. It's really hard for me to start thinking exaggerated. I don't want to make the legs like two thirds of their entire body. It just feels wrong to me. And I don't want to make the head a totally unbelievable size either because some part of me thinks that if I stray too far from this normal spectrum here, then my art is going to become too cartoony or too unbelievable. And I'm someone who only wants to draw believable humans only. But that is a misunderstanding. If you look at these two comparisons here, this is a way more interesting cast of characters, like just from a purely design standpoint than Sailor Moon. Everyone in Sailor Moon kind of has the same body type, same proportions. They're all pretty girls, right? But in Howl's Moving Castle and Ghibli films in general, they really prioritize making a very rich and diverse cast of interesting characters that are all different from each other. The way I like to think about it is, for example, if I just drew a head here, normally I would want to go straight for like 
a normal size rib cage, but I'm going to stop myself from doing that and try like a chibi style, referencing this thing over here and make the body like really small. And if this is the entire body, I have a few options from here. I can make the legs really long and that would be a really interesting choice, I think. But I'm going to make the legs really short, like barely sticking out. And at this point, you can make the arms really long. <laughs> and this would be a very interesting character choice, I guess. But let's just keep them really small for now um, and make a very typical chibi. And so for the head, like within the head, you can play around with so many things. If I wanted to give this character like a bob haircut, this is kind of where I default, like putting the bangs straight down the middle and the hair ending like where the head ends. But what if I put the bangs way down here and the hair ends right there too. So it's like a bowl cut. And from here, there's a couple choices like with the eyes and the facial features. I'd probably default to something like this, but what if you made the eyes like take up half of this space? And within the eyes, you could go like where are the pupils and where are the irises? Like you can make the iris like really big so that the whites are very small like this. Or you can make the irises and pupils like really small, like barely there like this. I mean, these are all ways you can experiment with this and create a really interesting and diverse cast of characters. For example, what if I went the opposite direction of this character that I just drew and I put the bangs like way up high and I made the eyes very big like this and I made the irises and pupils really big too. This is kind of just like a power put of character, isn't it? <laughs> so by doing this and thinking about all the different ways you can exaggerate the different body parts and facial features of a character, you can start to get some really interesting results. And so what I'm going to do is that I have these OCs that I showed you a few chapters ago for the same pose syndrome and they all also have like same body syndrome. They literally all have the same body proportions, except for Sabrina here because she's like the youngest of them all, but sh even she has kind of a super normal body proportion. So let's just take Sabrina here as an example and let me break down why this is boring and how we can use proportions to make her more interesting. She is supposed to be around 12, 13, 14, around like the preteen age where you're like, where you're kind of angry at the world for no reason. She is supposed to be very spunky and feisty, but her design is the opposite of that. It's quite boring and here's why. Her hair is one of the key points, her body here, her torso, and then her shorts, and then her legs. And these are all like exactly the same size. If we broke her down by like upper body versus lower body, also all the same size. She's basically broken down into like halves here and fourths of equally sized portions. And even her sword, her sword is basically the same length as like her upper body and her lower body. So these are all really super even. There's no statement here. There's nothing for us to focus on or latch onto. There's no like really big areas of rest and no condensed areas of details. So what we can do is play around with this. All right, so here I've blocked out a base, a very normally proportioned base. But from here, we can start to make this more interesting. For example, her shirt. Her shirt and her shorts and her hair are all the exact same length. If we exaggerated one of these and made the others smaller, it would make the entire design more interesting. So let me just push the shirt because I think having a baggy shirt is going to really kind of push the edgy rebellious side of her. So yeah, a normal shirt would end here, which is where it does on her character right now, but I'm going to put it all the way down here, like mid thigh. And because it is so low, I'm going to make her shorts only peek out a little bit. And her sleeves right now are a really normal sleeve length, but I'm going to push it maybe to like elbow forearm length here. And this is already looking a lot more interesting than this one. Next is her legs. Her legs are basically the exact same length as these things as well. So what I'm going to do is going to, I'm going to make her legs like a little shorter because she is supposed to be the youngest character in the cast. And it's just weird if she has the same proportions as the rest of them. By making her legs a lot smaller, I can make her look a little bit younger and it's going to really emphasize how big this shirt is. 
Next is her shoes. Here her shoes are bigger than normal, but like kind of a safer exaggeration. Like they do look kind of oversized, but not super oversized. So I'm going to push that and make them like obviously kind of too big for her. And next is her socks. As you can see here, her socks perfectly divide her legs in half. Like this section is the exact same as this section. So it'd be more interesting if we put it either really low or really high, but not halfway. Halfway doesn't say anything. It doesn't really tell us anything. So I'm just going to put her socks like kind of low. And next we can work on her face and her hair. So her hair here is a very ordinary length. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to exaggerate that. I'm going to make her hair like really long. And with her face, we can also choose where to put the hairline. Like we could put the hairline really low if we wanted, but I'm going to keep it at like a normal length here. And I'm going to kind of exaggerate how big her hair is. And even with the bangs, we have a choice with like literally everything that we draw here. With the bangs here, they fall right in the center of her face. And like I said before, if you put things in the center or make things very even, it's going to make a design that is too balanced and too boring. Of course, if you want a balanced and boring character, this is something you can do purposefully. But if you want to make an interesting character, a more spunky character, then you might want to exaggerate certain features. So her hair, I'm going to put it like all the way down here. And I'm going to make her hair like her entire body length. This is really going to help her silhouette. I think I kind of wanted her to have some sort of like diamond motif, but it doesn't come across at all. So we can start to exaggerate that diamond motif with her silhouette and making her hair extremely large. And next with her face, here she has a very normal like facial feature distribution, but we can start to push that. Like we can start to condense all of her features together like in one area and leave a lot more space for her forehead here because on a younger person, their forehead is probably going to be a lot bigger. And even with her hair here, I can kind of see it's falling straight down the middle of her face. You can kind of exaggerate that. Make it cover the majority of her face here. Here I'm going to pull up some reference photos of how her sword works because I think I had a very interesting idea for how, how she would carry her sword. And we can do a lot of interesting things with that sword, you know. It's a very safe length, and so we can start to mess with that. And also these little straps here are going to help her have a more unique silhouette. Alright, so here's the end result of how we reworked her design to be more interesting and exaggerated. Over here, I just have some more explorations of when I was playing around with the idea of how to exaggerate her character. As you can see, this is my favorite one, which is the one I demonstrated to you. And after I did that one, I did this one, which I took the ideas from here and I turned them the complete opposite way. So I said, if she has a super large shirt here and really small shorts, I'm going to try and see what it looks like if I do the opposite thing and give her a really small shirt and really long shorts and really small shoes. And so for your assignment for this video, all I want you to do is like doodle, experiment, because I don't think it's possible to understand how to experiment with proportions without like just drawing a lot and messing around. It's actually quite fun because it requires you to ask yourself at each stage before you draw anything, what if this? What if that? And it forces you to break habits, which is great. You can apply these proportion ideas to literally anything that you draw. For example, if you just draw a face, I think normal proportions would be like eyes here, nose here, mouth here. But what if you made the eyes really high and the nose really big and the mouth sticking quite close to the nose? Now that is a character. And what if you put the eyes really close together and near the bottom and they're kind of big and put the nose really small and the mouth really small. No matter what, I think you should try to employ like big, medium, small. You might naturally be doing it when you are thinking it this way. But basically what big, medium, small means is that in a design or a drawing, you should always be considering the way you stack like proportions. I would say this is medium, this is big, this is small, medium, medium. And this sort of variety is going to be infinitely more interesting than something like this, which is medium all the way down. 
Another way you might think about this is the 80-20 rule. For example, the hair here takes up 80% of her entire height and 20% is maybe taken up by her shoes. And same thing with her hair. Her bangs take up 80% of her entire face, leaving 20% at the bottom. And same thing with her body and her clothes here. Her shirt takes up 80% of that space and her shorts take up 20. For example, if you're drawing the eye, it's way more interesting if you do like a really tiny pupil and a whole bunch of white space. So that is 80% white space, 20% pupil. Or if you do the opposite and do like 80% iris and like 20% white space. What's not particularly interesting or saying anything is if you draw like a normal sized iris. So yeah, your assignment is quite simple. All I want you to do is fill a sketch page with proportion experimentations. You can use an existing character you have that might need a update like Sabrina did. It can be quite interesting to do this with like an anime character who has kind of really super normal proportions. Or you can find people on Pinterest or whatever you want to use that have really interesting features that would be great for exaggeration. So it's kind of freeform this time, but it's important to experiment. And I'll see you guys in the next video. All right, let's have a little chat about shapes and how to use them in character designing and character stylization. So if you've watched any videos or seen any tutorials on character design and shape, you probably have seen, you know, circles are warm and friendly, squares are stable and reliable, triangles are evil, or something like that. But I think in application, the better way to understand how to use shapes is that if you use a shape once, you should use it again somewhere in the design. And this is going to give you a sense of rhythm and a sense of consistency within the design. So what this means is basically if you have a circle here, curvy is a circle, then you should have some other sort of circular shape in their design. And as it is with curvy, literally everything else is circular as well. If you use it once, you should probably find somewhere else to use it and at a different scale. That's all rhythm really means. And so we're going to take a look at a whole bunch of examples. So this old guy from up, clearly he is a square shape and this square shape is used over and over again in his design. Right down to his belt, right down to his glasses. Everything in him is pretty much a square. And here we have Nui from Kill a Kill. And rhythm is something that can be found especially within like really fashionable characters. Characters who have a lot of details to their outfits. For example, Nui, her bow, she has a bow up here, and so we're going to see the bow repeated in many other areas. She has a bow down there, she has bows on her boots, just a ton of bows overall in her outfit. One back here, and she's got all these little frilly bits, like frills here, frills again, frills, frills on her boots, frills on her little wrist cuffs here. You even see this in her hair. Her hair is basically the same shape repeated multiple times but smaller. And you can find this in real life people who know how to put together outfits. For example, this person on the left, they have a very square motif going on. Everything in their outfit is very rectangular, very square-ish. Right down to their bangs, their bangs are very square and straight. Their bag is also very square. This entire outfit is made up of straight lines and squares. This person here, the buns up here are repeated over and over again in their outfit. So like two little circular things. They have two circular earrings, two little roses on their shirt, and two puffy sleeves here. With Gamagori, this is very, very apparent. He has three spiky things everywhere. Like spiky things in three, that's his motive. Three spiky things here, three spiky things here, three spiky things on his neck collar thing, three spiky things here, three spiky things on his knuckle guards, and three spiky things on his shoes. So this sort of repetition of shape is going to bring a design together and make it more cohesive. Just a few more examples because we can't, I found a lot of examples because this is a very common design trick or design principle that people follow. For Death the Kid, it's his three stripes. 
he has three stripes in his hair, three stripes on his suit here, and there's four stripes here, but they're still stripes. And there's three triangles here, and he also has a skull motif. If you have some sort of symbol on your character, then make sure to repeat it somewhere else so that it's not just random. So he has a skull here, he wears a ring that's a skull, and he has a little skull on his guns too. So if it was just one of those things, it's going to be a little bit random, but since we see it in three places on his character, we know that this is his motive. We also see this happening in uniforms a lot. For example, in Misato's uniform in Neon Genesis, this sort of V shape appears over and over again on her shoulder, on her hat, on her sleeves here. And I guess you could say from the back, like this sort of shape is also a little bit of a V here. And of course, the buttons are a nice repetitive shape that happens over and over again in order to create consistency in her character. For Zagreus, I think it's his laurels. His laurels are kind of like this sort of shape. And they appear again on his sword. His hair is also like the exact same shape as those laurels, so that's a nice repetitive shape in his character. And we're going to see threes a lot on him. For example, he has three skulls here, not just one, there's three. And he's got three skulls again on his belt. And even within his clothes, you can see the same shape being repeated over and over again in the folds. This sort of triangular shape that's like becoming smaller and smaller is being used in his clothes here. This is not necessarily a design choice, but it's like a way to create rhythm within a drawing. And you could say that here on his outfit, there's kind of like this triangular motif pointing upwards. You can see the same thing in his sword. The same triangles are kind of going upwards up his sword. And you're going to see it a lot in cultural clothing and costume design for movies as well. So this is from Black Panther. For the queen, it's this sort of circular flared out shape like this. That's repeated again in this. I don't even know what to call it, whatever this thing is. For Shori, it's her beaded jewelry elements down her face and draping all over her body here. All right, so that was a lot of examples. Here's a demonstration of me trying to put the things that we studied to use. I'm redesigning a character that I did like earlier this year, I think, or last year, I'm not sure. But I started off by giving him lanky and really thin limbs. And so I thought that was the motif and the shape language that I was going to bring throughout the piece, like long, thin limbs and just wispy elements into his character. So I made his mask have really long ears and I was playing around with this sort of flared out motif as well, trying to bring that into different areas of his design, into his sleeves, into the bottom of his robe there, and into the hair, but I just didn't feel like it worked very well. So I ended up redesigning him like multiple times. I really wanted the long and lanky feeling to read throughout the character. And the previous design, I did like it with the like flared out bottoms, but it didn't really match what I was trying to go for. And so here I'm playing around with proportions some more and bringing his legs way down and making his upper body really short. And now I'm just like trying to figure out the hair and making that match the wispiness of the rest of him. Here I'm just adding some additional elements, like patterns, in order to bring the whole thing together. And I added some wispy elements to his bracelet as well to match the hair. Alright, so here's where we ended up. I wanted this character to become very lanky, very wispy, and I tried to concentrate a lot of detail up here, especially in like this portion up here, and have areas of rest down here. I added a pattern to certain areas of his clothing in order to get that sort of cohesiveness. And I kind of repeated this sort of pointy and very long triangle in a lot of areas on the bracelet. This is kind of random. I think there might be feathers, but honestly, it's just like a random design choice. In the hair, 
in this little eye thing here. Honestly, this version may have fit the original character more, and I, I just totally kind of changed the entire mood and read of the original character with the new one. But I think this design overall is more cohesive than it was before. Before it was kind of like plain and very generic. But now there's some kind of message I'm trying to send with this character. You kind of know what read you're supposed to get when you look at this character versus like something like- Alright, so here's your assignments. Fill a sketch page by experimenting with drawing characters using repeating shapes, symbols, and patterns. So yeah, just more experimentation. The only way to learn this is to do it a lot and to get your hands dirty and just have fun. Alright, this video is going to be about expressions and body language and basically how to capture a character's personality. To do this, I have two original characters here who I haven't really developed whatsoever. I do have some ideas, but I'm going to spend this entire chapter developing them from zero to hopefully a more fleshed out character. Okay, let's set up some headcanons, I guess. I don't know why I would need to headcanon my own characters, but here's what I think. I think they both probably work for some sinister institution. I'm thinking this guy here, probably like some sort of scientist or surgeon or doctor, something among those lines. And then this one here, kind of like a handyman, a mechanic, or a jack of all trades who just does whatever people need him to do. And I'm just gonna call them glasses and ponytail because honestly naming characters is like the bane of my existence. So my first order of business was figuring out how these characters stand. Something very simple, but people of different personalities are going to stand in different ways. And so glasses character. I imagine he is very reserved and closed off, so he's going to have his arms crossed to act as a barrier. He's probably going to have a lot of his limbs crossed constantly, like one foot in front of the other. And I heard this from a acting workshop, but looking back at this speed paint thing, I think I could have done better because right now he's kind of leading with his chest. And characters that lead with their chest tend to be like, have a lot of proudness and bra bravado, basically brawn over brains. But if I were to do this over again, I think I would make him lead with his head, which represents a character that is more curious, that is more brainy versus brawny. So yeah, everything about his resting, like standing posture is going to be pretty stiff and guarded. He's not going to really let anybody in. He's naturally pretty distressful, I think. And Ponytail character here is going to be the opposite. He's pretty open and casual with everybody, and he's very relaxed and comfortable in his own body. So he's going to have more asymmetry to his poses. His limbs are naturally just going to be more open than Glasses character because he's more open to interacting with other people. He seems to be the type of person who's not naturally on guard like Glasses character, but I think he is like on guard in a different way, like mentally. I'm pretty sure he always has like a resting smile just so he can appear friendly and non-threatening, which for the most part he is. I mean, he's going to have to talk to a lot of people if, if he's going to be working a lot of odd jobs everywhere around whatever this mysterious institution is, which I'm beginning to think might be a school, which I guess is pretty sinister still. <laughs> I decided to do sitting poses and same kind of deal. Glasses character is going to have a lot of crossed limbs. He's going to be on guard and kind of like protecting himself. He's probably going to have some sort of item in his lap because it makes him feel safer. Like maybe a book or his bag or something among those lines. I mean, everything about this type of character kind of screams unapproachable. Please do not talk to me, you know. Meanwhile, Ponytail is going to be Again, the opposite. He's going to be pretty open and relaxed and have a lot of asymmetry in his poses. So here I have one of his legs like propped on the other. He's going to be kind of draped over the chair in a very casual manner. He's good at showing people that he's interested in what they're talking about. He is like probably an extrovert. I think if he had a choice, he would not even sit in a chair. He would probably like sit on the desk or sit on the floor. And here I have him turning over the chair. He just doesn't want to sit in chairs normally. He just likes to play around and be fun with how his physical body is behaving. Maybe he's a little bit too consciously relaxed, which 
in my eyes makes people like that suspicious but you know what if he wants to be like that you can do you all right next i explored different types of emotions on these characters most namely like fake smiles or forced smiles and for this glasses character i think he will probably smile in a very sinister way because i'm pretty sure he likes doing a lot of experiments that are a little bit questionable and that's where he gets enjoyment from and he also probably enjoys scaring people by smiling at them at very inopportune times when a character like this who's usually very straight-faced and serious and reserved who usually does not smile smiles at you you know that there's probably something coming for you and that you should probably be on your guard for a ponytail character i kind of had a hard time like figuring out what would make this character fake smile because i think he is a really go with the flow character who just like accepts what anyone is going to be saying at any time and finds amusement in like everything and so i'm not sure what he would what kind of situation would make him force a smile i kind of went for like a uncomfortable smile like if someone said a really bad joke or if someone said something that goes directly against his moral stance but he doesn't want to say anything so he's going to be doing his best to smile but it's going to be strained which i represented with like a little mark next to his mouth and under his eye and some sweat marks and you can see he's facing the other way he's trying to get out of that situation <laughs> all right next i went with a more genuine smile i thought about what would make these characters smile for real and for glasses character i think maybe he is caught off guard something surprises him and he just naturally smiles i think smiles for him are very rare and very subtle but when he does smile it's kind of like a reward for whoever is seeing that so i make his eyes go up at the corners a little bit and have a little bit of blushy marks there and his eyebrows are going up as well very subtly and he starts to adopt a more open type of expression that you would normally see on the ponytail type character and speaking of this ponytail character uh, drawing a real smile for him was not very challenging at all. I think this type of thing comes naturally to his type of character. So I tried to exaggerate it some more and make it so that he was extremely happy and very much laughing. So a really big mouth that takes up like half of his face and the corners of his mouth are pushing his cheeks up, which are closing his eyes and pushing his eyes up. And he's going to be pointing at whoever made him laugh because Damn, that was a good joke. And kind of a non sequitur, but I wanted to experiment with my other characters too. So I set up a scenario for them. And the scenario was what would they be acting like if they saw a dog? First, I'm drawing August, who has a very dog-like personality himself. So I think he's going to be very excited to see a dog. He's going to have a wide open smile. His eyebrows are going to be going way up and his eyes are going to be very open. He's just a very open and excitable character. His hair is going to be all bouncy and fluffy because he's probably like jumping up and down like, whoa, that's my brethren right there. That's a dog. And I kind of made his eyes like a little bit glittery because he is extremely excited and he's going to be waving his hands all over the place being like, hello, my brethren. <laughs> this type of character is very excitable and expressive and has no problem showing his emotions. Next, I drew Emmy, who is kind of the opposite of August. She's kind of like a tough girl, and she's not going to want to acknowledge that she finds the dog cute, but she definitely finds the dog cute. And so she's going to be kind of like walking away, looking back at the dog, trying to pretend that she really doesn't care about this thing, but she really does. And so I added like little blushy marks and... Her mouth is like kind of pouty, like she's trying really hard not to smile. And her eyebrows are going to be a little bit angry, like how dare this thing make me feel emotions. She is really kind of your quintessential tsundere. 
And lastly, I drew Benji and his personality is kind of like, he is definitely stuck in his own world. He's listening to music, he's very tired, he has his hood up, he really doesn't want to acknowledge that the outside world exists, and he's probably just trying to make it to his next class or get his coffee without too much trouble. So I really don't think he even sees a dog at all. If he does see a dog, it's because he's looking at his phone and someone posted a cute picture of a dog on social media. That's the only time he's gonna see a dog. Alright, so that was kind of a look at how I explore the personalities of different characters and how they would act in different scenarios from as interesting as seeing a dog to as normal as how they would just sit in everyday life. By exploring these very normal things, you can start to understand your characters a lot more. And here is the assignment or exercise for this video. Using at least two characters with different personalities, explore what their expressions and body language is like in different scenarios. So this is going back to designing in pairs. I think it's more interesting to compare and contrast how two characters behave because no two characters are going to behave the same way. No two characters are going to express the same emotion in the same way. And of course, there's many different ways to draw emotions and body language. Here I have like four artists that I really enjoy, but they all draw emotions in very different ways. So for example, a more Western style, this is Epsi and this is Shiyun Kim. Their styles tend to be a lot more realistic. And when they draw expressions, they're going to stick to the structure of a skull in the face. Whereas in anime and more cartoony styles, there's going to be a lot more exaggeration. So you can pick and choose what kind of style you want to go for and experiment. I think it's interesting to try out all of them at some point. Hopefully this is a fun one for you and I will see you in the next video. Let's talk about clothing, hair, and accessories when it comes to character creation. This is like where I had my very first and most memorable art epiphany like in my artistic career or artistic journey. And this is because when I first started drawing characters and for a few years, up until summer of 2019, that's how specifically I remember this moment, I always drew characters wearing the same clothes. Like I would draw characters just wearing a t-shirt and unmarked pants like this and this was like the only thing I would be able to draw a character wearing and I didn't really see any sort of problem in that. This character is constantly just wearing t-shirts. Everybody in this sort of group shot is wearing a t-shirt and just pants of some sort. And even in this story, it's supposed to be historical. It's supposed to be set in the mid 1950s in America. That's a very historical and cultural moment, especially when it comes to fashion. It really just looks like I googled 1950s fashion and slapped on to these characters exactly what I saw on the front page of Google. And in summer of 2019, I distinctly remember realizing that you could put different clothes on characters and that there are a ton of clothes out there for you to draw. And so I started to put together a lot of Pinterest boards of like really specific fashion items. I remember getting extremely into shoes. You can see I started to get really interested in drawing like roller skates, ice skates, like little sneaker type shoes like this and getting really into like the details of how shoes are made because it was just so interesting to me to find this out. And I was really interested in like designing my own shoes and all the interesting shapes that go into sneakers and basketball shoes like this. So this entire phase of art, I think for me, was just realizing that there is so much fashion out there that I didn't know existed. And if you're a fashion conscious individual, this might all seem extremely obvious to you. But for someone like me who just wears the same hoodie every day, it was not obvious. It was like a huge revelation to me. And so this is just me talking to you if you're a person who is like me and does not pay a single mind to what people in the real world are dressing like and wearing to maybe get into fashion. You should get into research and specificity, which means that when you create a character, really think about what they're wearing, why they're wearing it, and how they're wearing it. So for example, these characters here, they're supposed to be stereotypical like anime characters that live in Japan. And so they're going to be wearing Japanese uniforms, but there are a lot of Japanese high school uniforms out there. And so you had to do research 
So when I was like drawing this story, I looked at a lot of different uniforms. And what I realized is that this type of uniform is called the Gakuran. And it is the most traditional type of Japanese uniform. And this type of uniform for boys is usually paired with like a more traditional sailor type uniform for girls. And high schools in Japan that are trying to be more modern are starting to lean away from this sort of uniform. They're starting to go with collared shirts and ties and blazers rather than this sort of boxy button down shirt. And once I had that figured out, I kind of thought about these two character types. He's going to be the class president. He's going to want to be very neat and pristine. So he's going to wear his uniform in a very orderly and perfect way. A more rowdy and delinquent-like character is going to wear the uniform wide open, have his shirt untucked, and probably have his buttons misaligned. However, in the comic version, I did end up going with a more Western type of uniform with the blazer and the tie but I still stuck with having some specificity. For example, the more laid back character is going to be wearing a hoodie under his blazer. He has his shirt untucked, his tie is very loose. Meanwhile, Mr. Perfect here has everything under control. His tie is all perfect, his shirt is tucked in. I think these two are just a good demonstration of how two characters can wear the same uniform in very different ways to express aspects of their personality. All right, so let's do an example and talk about designing the looks of these two characters. So I've put together these boards to brainstorm what these characters would be wearing and what kind of things they would be carrying on their person and their day-to-day -day life. Okay, so I've gone ahead and done some outfit sketches for Mr. Glass's character here. And the way I like to think about it is like in layers. And I like to think about their daily life and what kind of clothes they wear at what stage of their day. So for example, here, this is like streetwear, what he would like wear on the commute to work, just like outside. It ends up being like a long trench coat and he likes to carry an umbrella and briefcase with him. I think he likes to carry an umbrella because he likes to always be prepared. And I think his general dress for work anyway is probably very like academic and old school. At work anyway, I'm pretty sure this character would really like to be taken seriously so he dresses in a very formal way. And so I put him in like a sweater vest over a button down shirt with a tie. And these are dress pants and dress shoes. And he also has a wristwatch. I think he exchanges his trench coat for a lab coat. And this is just like me layering a lab coat over this outfit here. If he were to add another layer to that, it would probably be like some sort of rubbery apron. And at this point, I kind of got the feeling that this character was very one dimensional and kind of flat because we've seen this kind of character before. We've seen the dark academia type character who wears glasses, who wears sweater vests, who always dresses real nicely, carries a briefcase, has a umbrella. That's kind of like Kingsman's whole aesthetic, you know? And so I kind of wondered how I could make this character more interesting. And so I started to consider his home life. I thought about if this character is dressed so well during his normal working life, his home life, he probably dresses like trash. So that's what I did. I kind of considered like this character dresses too well. He needs to unwind somehow and he's probably really comfortable at home. There was the possibility that I just give him like a nice sweater and nice sweatpants and call that his home wear, but that didn't really feel right. It felt very predictable and so I thought I would never put this character in shorts. And so I put them in shorts. And when you're drawing like t-shirts and sweatshirts and hoodies, try to think about like what is on this piece of clothing. It's really easy to leave it blank, but if you think about all the hoodies and t-shirts that you own, it's probably a story behind how you came to own that thing. For example, if it was from middle school, if it was from high school, if it was from a club that you joined or a store that you really like to patron. And so I like adding little details like that. And I also think at home he pushes his hair back. I don't think he actually likes having hair in his face. He just styles it that way during work because it looks good and it looks formal. But at home, he's probably going to ditch that. And for a ponytail character here, I really just had a lot of fun exploring all the different types of working uniforms that these types of professions tend to have. And I still didn't settle on a single profession yet because there's just so much variety in all of these different outfits. 
I kind of noticed that people working in like construction or more manual labor type jobs tend to wear like one piece outfits like jumpsuits probably because it helps so that their shirt doesn't get untucked or their shirt doesn't get flipped upside down and stuff like that so if I did this again I'd probably put him in a jumpsuit but for now he's just got like a shirt tucked into some big pants with lots of pockets and I just had some fun like experimenting with all the different types of outfits that people working in manual labor tend to have so like big gloves, goggles, tool belts and then just like Glasses character I went ahead and thought about what his streetwear would look like I think he'd be the leather jacket kind of guy or like an old letterman jacket or something like that and then like home life the notorious blank sweater I think like blank sweaters for guys is actually really common and this guy has like no taste in fashion and so I think a blank sweater for him is like pretty fitting but then the same thing with the glasses character came up. I was like, since I made the glasses character so cleaned up in working life and trashy at home, and so I thought, what if this character works in all these manual labor jobs, but he actually is the son of a really rich family or actually the boss of the entire institution and he's just like doing some undercover boss shit. And so I was like, what would this character look like if he cleaned up a little bit? And you know, kind of had a hard time with that because <laughs> I never even tried to think about what he would look like in formal wear. Looks a little weird, but it does introduce an interesting dimension to his character. Like if he had the resources to dress like this and instead he chooses to work manual labor, there's got to be an interesting reason as to why. So yeah, this is a pretty fun exercise to do if you're creating characters for the first time and you want to explore their look. Basically think about a day in your character's life and then consider what they'll be wearing when. When it comes to hair and accessories, the thing to think about would be like what this character prioritizes. Like does this character care about how their hair looks? Do they get it dyed and groomed properly or do they just like comb it and go? For Mr. Glasses here, he doesn't give two craps about what his hair looks like at home, but when he goes out he wants to look good so he will style it. And for a ponytail character here, I really don't think he cares about his hair whatsoever. And he's probably letting it grow too long. He's been too lazy to get it cut or it just never crosses his mind to. And so he ties it back. But hair can also be a huge like design choice. Hair is just a shape. And this entire chapter is about character creation, not character design. So like, for example, we did all these outfits here, but the design of these characters is still quite boring. If we were to focus on the design aspect, we would be focusing on making these characters more visually fit their personalities, but these are like two different subjects. So figure out one thing at a time and slowly these things will start to mesh into the character in your head. Very simple assignment for this one, draw a day in your character's life in outfits and accessories and or special occasion outfits, whichever kind fits your character the most. I know that my demonstrations and explanations mostly fit like real life type characters the most and does not really cover like fantasy wear or super cultural settings, but I think you pretty much get the gist of it, right? I would really advise you put together like a board of reference first for all these outfits and accessories and just the general vibe of your character before attempting this or else like your visual library is gonna just fail you right away. <laughs> okay, have fun with this one and I will see you in the very last video of this chapter which is about character interaction. Okay, let's talk about character interaction. This is one of my favorite things to draw and to brainstorm about because it's like the prime way to play around with characters personalities and how characters interact in fun ways. At the time of making this video actually the shipping dynamics thing is picking up again on Twitter and I just thought it was like extremely funny timing because this is kind of exactly what I want you to think about. When you approach character interaction you have to really Think about the dynamics between the characters that are interacting. And while it might not always be a ship or romantic, this sort of breakdown is great. Like this type of like tropey understanding of what two characters are to each other and how they behave in relation to each other, it's going to be what makes your interactions very interesting. My favorite example from my art is probably this Haruhi fan art. 
it's really easy to do like character interactions with fan art because these are characters that have a very established personality, have a very established like story with each other, so it's easy to draw them interacting because we know and can predict what kind of scenarios they would get into and how they would behave with each other. And so with Haruhi, Haruhi is the leader of this group, so she is going to be the like tip of this triangle here. She is the most enthusiastic here, and she's the one that's like egging everyone else on. Kyon is amusing her. He's kind of like draped and he really doesn't want to be here, but he's going to so that she doesn't destroy the world. Mikuru here is extremely scared of what is happening, and so she's going to have a very like closed in body language. She's like clutching her elbows really close to her, and her knees are going to be going up while they're jumping. Koizumi is just here to have a good time. He likes amusing people, and he is definitely not opposed to giving Miss Asahina a hand. And Yuki, I think she somewhat sees Kyon as a savior or a good friend who she never expected to have, so she does have a more reserved kind of body language, but she is interested in, you know, holding his hand, seeing what's up. And so when I was drawing this sort of image, like, it's kind of complicated image, right? There's a lot of limbs and hands and bodies. The idea was the main cast of Haruhi Susumiya jumping together. And in order to make that sort of idea interesting, you have to consider the character dynamics within that group, and it just happens to be what I laid out for you. And the same thing basically applies to every character interaction that you might want to draw. The prompt is always simple, you know, like characters hugging, but the execution is going to heavily depend on who the characters are and what their relationship is with each other. So Sasuke probably is really not used to being hugged, meanwhile these two tend to be more affectionate and outgoing. In this sort of interaction, it's all about body language and stature. So these are all like really powerful teachers and they all have white hair, and these guys are all pretty relaxed, but Reagan here is just a completely normal man, so I think he is feeling a little bit uneasy, and so his body language is pretty closed off, he has his arms crossed, he is sweating a little bit, but these guys are extremely relaxed, Gojo has his hands around Reagan. he's talking with Stein, they're not even paying attention to him, but he is having a moment in his head. And so yeah, the prompt is always simple, you know? Four teachers standing and talking. But because these four teachers are who they are, it's going to make the image interesting. Here we go about the friendship dynamic type thing again. Sokka and Zuko, I feel like they make each other more stupid, so that's a really interesting and fun type of friendship to draw. They will definitely get each other into trouble, and Katara is the one who always has to bail them out. And when I do these things, I really like to put a lot of emphasis on what people's hands are doing and where they're looking. So here, Sokka is looking at Zuko trying to convince him to look at these swords that they're gonna get. And Zuko is looking at the swords. So our eye line goes like Sokka, Zuko, here, and maybe like at the hand somewhat. For like this talking one, I mean, Gojo doesn't have eyes, but he's probably looking at Stein, and Stein is probably looking back. He's pointing at Stein, Stein is gesturing back, so our eye naturally goes like this sort of motion, and Reagan is just caught in the middle of that. This is my friend's OCs, and some kind of like really simple and cute interaction like this is just like friends talking. He's the one talking, so they're all going to be paying attention to him. This character has doubts about whatever he's saying, and this one is happily interacting. And they're all looking over here, so our eye is naturally following their eyes to this character here. And again with the Haruhi one, they're all holding hands, so that was part of the prompt. They all have to be holding hands and they all jump. And when we look at their eye line, I'm trying to guide the eye like this, right, to this triangle shape here. And so Haru, number one, leads the eye, but also number two, tells us what these characters are thinking about. So here I've labeled all of these different interactions, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to see what these interactions look like if I make these two characters do them. So yeah, I went ahead and did that. The first one was hugging, and... I really tried to imagine what the relationship between these two characters are because I understand them separately, but I don't know who they are to each other. So I had to think really hard about like, are they co-workers? Do they just know each other at work? Or are they friends outside of work? Are they friends at work? Are they roommates? What exactly is the relationship here and how do they interact with each other? And I kind of came to the conclusion that the glasses character, his stereotype is like a mad scientist, and 
He is reserved. I don't think he likes being hugged or touched normally. And so if you tell Mr. Ponytail, you gotta go hug him, he's going to try, but Glass's character is gonna be like, giving him subtle messaging to do not even try to touch me or you will get hurt. And then I tried out another version, like what if Glass's character was initiating a hug? Under what circumstances would he do that and what kind of hug would that be? And I came to the conclusion that it'd probably be like a very spontaneous sort of thing. Maybe they're like doing an experiment together and something actually worked for once and Glass's character gets really excited and starts to shake Ponytail, who was not ready for that. So I think their dynamic is that Glass's character scares Ponytail a little bit. He's kind of finicky and doesn't like being messed with or touched or interacted with, but when he's excited, he will unleash all of his excitement upon Ponytail character. The next one is like jumping together. This one was really random. I do not know why these two characters would jump together like the Haruhi characters would. So maybe it, like they're taking a picture and they're being forced to hold hands and jump. I really think that the scientist character is just gonna stand there stiff like a board and ponytail character is going to try to jump, but he's kind of being held down by this immovable rock. Next is shopping together. I actually edited out like a ton of time where I was just sitting there thinking because I was just blanking on like why they would be shopping together, what kind of circumstance they would be shopping together. And so I ended up doing like they're shopping for their tools together and they get really picky about their own professions. And so scientist character is going to be really picky about what scissors he gets and it's going to all look the same to Ponytail. And if they go into a store that Ponytail likes, like maybe a tool store, all of these tools are going to look exactly the same to the scientist character. He's really not going to get why. <laughs> Ponytail is getting so picky about these tools that all look the same. So I think this sort of interaction just illustrates that these characters are very similar when it comes to working and how they treat their work. Next is taking a break together, and at this point I was kind of thinking that we needed some more softer moments because I think the previous moments were all like scientist character scaring ponytail character or them not really understanding each other, but I do think that they have some sort of mutual understanding and that there can be some nicer moments between them. And so this is kind of an illustration of scientist character seeking out ponytail character asking him to take a break with him together, bringing him his favorite coffee or drink or whatever so that they can chat together and maybe talk about their next experiment. Singing together is kind of like the same kind of deal. I don't think they would ever like do karaoke together, but I did think about scenarios that they might be in together. And I think that maybe if they were on a drive, maybe going to check out some weird location or pick up some experimental materials that Ponytail character is probably the type to sing in the car and scientist character would not sing with him but may just enjoy the moment. Alright, so we did five different types of interactions for these two characters. As you can see, they're very crude and messy and not cleaned up at all. But when you're doing these types of explorations, I think you should concentrate on the interaction and the story aspect instead of getting super caught up in like if you have the correct fundamentals or if you have a perfect style. Doing character interactions is foremost about figuring out the story moment that is happening with these two characters. That is just a very long excuse for me not having time to draw really good drawings, but I think there's something funny about how crude these are. Alright, so that concludes our character creation chapter. We took these two rando characters that I really had no story for whatsoever, and we explored their different body languages, their different expressions, what kind of outfits they wear day to day, and what kind of interactions they have with each other, and what kind of relationship they have. This was pretty fun for me. I hope it was interesting to follow along. 
Here's the very last assignment or exercise and it's extremely simple. Draw three different character interactions. I will have some prompts in the class notes if you want to build it off of those. I also found a really good prompts list from Sallyson Tumblr, which is right here. A hundred entire drawing prompts for character interaction. So yeah, have fun with this one. This is the last lesson of the entire class. And I will 